and I'm joined by Greg Hart at Cats in Space. How are you doing, Greg, mate? I'm very good, thanks, Lee. Take two. <laughs> <laughs> Giving the game away there. Yeah. No, good, mate. Good, mate. Really good. No, glad, glad to see you. Like, like I said uh, before, it decided uh, not to record you earlier. <laughs> um, you know, uh, last time we spoke uh, around about the, the first leg of the Kickstart the Sun uh, tour that you did last year, uh, you were alluding to the fact that the second leg of the tour you know, you were going to go putting this theatre aspect into it and you were sort of uh, coming up with ideas and investing into doing that and uh, bringing a, a more theatrical aspect to the show, I guess. Um, so you, they say you've done the, the couple of shows in July. They look like they've gone really well, mate. Yeah, really well. I mean, obviously, when we first put the idea together, it was, uh, you know, we didn't quite know what it was going to end up being because it, it moved and twisted and turned a lot as the procedure went along. Um, James, that guy that put the stage production together it took a lot of dark turns and a lot of you know kind of weird things um to get it to work how we want it to work and obviously this is something we've never done before yeah. although he's experienced in that field with his with his other you know his old company you know doing strictly and x factor and stuff like that this was a new thing because we were building a, actually a set like as I call it, the 80s Doctor Who set. It's, it's, it's literally like that. It's made out of wood. It's been handmade. It's been hand painted. It's got multi facets to it. And there's three screens that all show different images from behind the band. So it was a, a huge thing to, to, to try and work out. But we worked it out. Um, it looked amazing. Um, and the first three shows in July went really well, really well. I mean, they were well attended, good tickets. People were genuinely very excited to see it and the audience response at the end of all the shows, because obviously we've seen some private footage that we were filming from the, the back of the hall and best cats gigs, simple as that. They're the best cats in space gigs so far. Um, people are genuinely rooting for us to make this work. And also they are genuinely very excited about it when they come and see it because They've not seen anything like it. You know, no one's seen anything like what we're doing before. Yeah, you know, not on this on this scale on this level. Yeah. Um, and the, in a nutshell, the joy of this production is it's totally able to scale up to any size venue. So say. by taking the yeah taking the principles of it, we can blow it up to the O2. You know, it's that's that's the level of quality of the footage um obviously the set build would be different but yeah. yeah so we're really chuffed that it's worked and it's it's a lot of work and a lot of man hours have gone into it but it's yes yeah, it's, it's worth a treat so it's no hype it's a it's a really good show yeah i mean i'm looking forward to because like you'll come into the apex here in various moments on the on the friday 15th of september that's right. yeah, me and joe come down to that looking forward yeah, to, yeah. looking forward to it man it's gonna be a good one that's yeah. good. I mean, the, the Apex is selling really well for us as well. It's another really good seller. So, um, yeah, we're hoping for a lot of noise down there. Uh, it's a great venue. I've, I know it from old, obviously. I've played there loads of times before. Yeah. It's one of my favourite venues because it's just, there's something about it. I don't know what it is, but there's something about the Apex. It's good sound, hmm. great people, great layout. It's it's a very, um, what's the word? It's very audience friendly as in wherever you are in, in the in the auditorium you can see you know because yeah, you've got the sides and the night yeah. it's just a really cool place so yeah we're, we're we're chuffed it's selling well i think we could we could get near capacity there if we if we're lucky yeah i mean yeah i mean i was down there the other week with my own festival as you know i, I put my own festival in, in there oh the vambo yeah, boys yeah. say hello by the way because i had vambo on and they told me to say hello because oh knew. yeah cool um cool. And uh, saw the the poster banner that you had up there, and I was chatting to uh, Tim and some of the other guys down at the Apex, and they were, you know, they were telling me, oh yeah, that one's selling really well, and you coming down sort of thing. And it's, looks like there's a looks like it should be a really good show, man. Yeah, I think it will be. I think it's, um, it's it was definitely one of the venues I really really wanted to get into when we put the tour together, because um, you know because of the size and the logistics, it was it's just a really good venue. So yeah. Fingers crossed, it's it's doing us well so far. If we can keep plugging away at it, we, it's going to be a noisy night. And also, we're recording the shows as well. Oh, nice. Um, so if we play well and everybody's on form throughout the tour, we'll get a live album out of it. So cool. the more people that come along to see it and make a lot of noise, the more chance they've got of getting on the album. So that's also really good. So come along, make lots of noise, shout and scream in the right places, and you'll get onto vinyl. So. Perfect. What more can you want? 
about exactly. With the stage show that you're saying, obviously, like I'm assuming you've helped to make it obviously adaptable for different theatre layouts and everything else. Is there any mm. theatres that you've not been able to get everything onto the stage, or is it so set up so that you can still get everything on the stage, just how it's done? No, the the only problem we've got, unfortunately, there's a couple of shows that we, we're going to struggle with um, because it's it's the depth of the stage because what okay. we're doing real we're doing rear projection and rear projectors that we're using, which are really expensive. Um, they need a six foot to eight foot throw. So you have to bring the whole stage forward by eight feet before you've even thought about putting your drum kit in. Mm. So if we can't get the projectors behind with enough throw and there's not enough in front for the bands, then it becomes quite tight. It says that there's a couple of shows that we might struggle with, but we're not a hundred percent sure yet because they might be able to build out. I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see near the time, but um, yeah, pretty much we're, we're good, good to go in all of them. So um, it, it's, a, it's a good show. It's, it's, it's worked out well. Yeah. That's cool, man. So um, the set, what, set list wise, you, is it a uh, kickstart the sun predominantly heavy set, I assume, with it being the second leg of the tour? Well, yeah, it's two sets. So the first set is Kickstart the Sun, and then the second set is all their other goodies from all their oh, albums. So, oh, cool. So, I didn't realize you did it two sets. Yeah, it, yeah, there's a 20 minute in for in the middle because at our age, we've got to go for a, a loo break, haven't we, and get another <laughs> drink. So <laughs> we're always thinking of our fans, you know, you know we're all of that age now. So. Um, but it, it works well because um, the Kickstart, it's it's not a ballad heavy album, but the way the set runs, because there's two songs that we're not doing, mm. unfortunately they're two up tempo numbers. So it does mean there's quite a lot of ballads in the first set. But it's as we've always said, it's about it's not just about bludgeoning people to death for 90 minutes. So you want to give them an experience. So the visuals and the way the songs work in the first set, it builds really nicely to the climax with bootleg bandoleros. Nice. That's where we smash it. And then we have a break. <laughs> And then we come on for the second set and we really smash their faces in because the second set is carnage. It's just bang, bang, bang. It's, it's, but there's a couple, there's a really nice new piece of music in the second set that's performed by Andy on keyboards and Dean on guitar, just the two of them. And oh, it's nice. almost a little, Jeff, it's like a Jeff Beck type tribute thing. It's not a tribute to Jeff Beck, but it, it's becoming that way, the way that it's gone down. It's absolutely taken the roof off. It's, it's really special. So that's something that no one would have heard before. Unless you've seen the show already, you won't have heard that. So that's oh, really that's cool, cool as well. That's cool. How did that piece come to be about then? Was that just something that came in like rehearsal? Um, well, we've always wanted for quite a while, we've always wanted to, to do an introduction to the song called Scars, which is off mm. of Scarecrow. And it's always been Dean doing the intro with Andy, then the song starts. And we always thought that that could be extended and become a little piece of its own, but we've we've never had the time or the the length of set to be able to do it until now. So um, Andy went away and composed this really lovely bit of music, and, and then he got together with Dean, and then Dean worked out this amazing piece of guitar, and it's, and we didn't know none of us in the band even heard it. We heard half of it in rehearsals. Yeah, and we never heard it properly till the first gig. So wow. that, that was a bit weird. But we was all at the side of the stage watching it going, "Blimey!" I didn't know it was going to be like this. It's really cool. So, yeah, and 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 the fans love it. So that's that's cool as well. There's oh. some really cool moments in the whole whole show with the visuals. You know, there's um, we've got a tribute in one of the songs that puts up lots of people that are no longer with us, you know, fans, families and husbands and wives and stuff like that. So that's a very emotional part of the show as well. But it, it's, it really does bring people together. It's like a real massive, big, kind of like a family thing in the auditorium. It's very cool. Do you feel like that, with that obviously, if that's feeding into your show, I'm assuming you've had to kind of take into consideration the sort of order of the songs that you're playing and like almost script it to reflect, you know, what's going on in the show itself. Yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously we've been working with James on the songs and how we we're going to do it. And also, I mean, when we did the first shows, it was such a last minute thing to get it all in place. And they were literally, the paint was drying on the morning of the first show, literally. It was wow. classic, you know, stage production. Everything goes up to the, the final minute, you know. Um, but what we said we'd do, we said, look, but these first three shows were, they were a, a test to see whether anything needed adapting. 
And all we all we're doing now is is James is being able to build more content with the August break that we've had. So the next run of dates there's going to be even more visuals because not every song's got a visual with it. It's some are, some are static, but a lot of the show is visual. But he's put more songs in now that have got visuals. So it's about ninety percent of the show is all visual, wow. which is an extraordinary amount of work yeah. um and we're also bringing more lights out as well for the second half which we we didn't get ready in time for the first three shows but we're bringing out some lights and um it's really good you know when people say yeah but how, how come why has nobody else done this you know the, the simple reason is you need someone like james is prepared to sit at home and program for hours upon hours upon hours enough footage to make a three minute four minute song times that by 25 songs you've got someone that needs to put six months of solid work into it you know yeah. and he stupidly agreed to do it <laughs> <laughs> so we're very, we're very we're very lucky you know we, we we laugh and joke about it but we're all really appreciative of the fact that you know not every band has got a james you know and he has literally put this show together working night and day for months and months and months and months because he says it it needs to be done you know we need to get cats in space up into a, a visual and like presentation and size that i think people expect us to be now you know we can't keep trudging around doing the same thing because it's it's ever diminishing returns you know it is for us um because we just can't project on on a, a club stage you know some we can because they're they're really cool but we just can't do it the way that we were doing it anymore we want to you know we want to be like ELO or something like that. Yeah. So, yeah. So we're we're forcing our way up the ladder just by going for it. You know, it's a, uh, you know, sit there and dream about it, or get off your ass and do it. And we're yeah. we're doing that. Okay. It must be nice to have someone like outside of the band though that's believing in you guys that much. So they're like, you know what, um, you, you guys, we just need to make this happen. And I saw James yeah. earlier yeah. today where when he was showing, so joking about that he wasn't harassing anyone online because he's been. Been doing all this sort of thing. So. He, he, he messaged me at four o'clock this morning with some random thing about one of the songs. I don't know what it was. I wasn't up. I didn't get it till this morning because I, <laughs> I know stuff all night. But he said, like, Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, we were very fortunate. We met him through a really good friend of mine, uh, Mick White, who's also in a really cool band called White Skies. So oh. shout out to White Skies. They're really, really, really good band. They're going to do a lot of gigs next year. So look out for them. Oh, they might. Mick and me go back, we go back 100 years, me and Mick. We're deadly twosome. But he introduced me to James, um, who came to do one of our videos. And that's how we met. And he just came on board. He just went, why do I not know you guys? Why have I not heard you guys before? And where have you been? He goes, you're the band that's missing from the modern era kind of thing. You know, no one's doing what you're doing. I said, I oh, know. And he's just kind of almost become this one man wrecking. You know, he, he wants to make Cats in Space the band that he sees it as. So yeah, we are very fortunate. Um, and he yeah, he's fully on board. I mean, he's like the he's like an Andy Kitson who does all our artworks. You know, right. they become silent members of the band because we are more than just six players. You know, it's to do this the way that you need to do it in this day and age. You you need to have so many man hours, you know. So we're very fortunate that we got these people that are crazy enough to, to come on board. You know, we're, it's like we're at an age now where this stuff is dying. You know, we, we can't keep harking back to the old days. You know, it's, it's just getting sadder to have to keep thinking about the yeah. glory days of Rush at Hammersmith Odeon and stuff like that. You know, it's you're like, well, why don't we make that still a thing? Yeah. If some bands can still do it. There's still a few bands out there that can do that. So... Let's just keep powering on, you know, before it all goes completely. It's it. I mean, like, any time I've seen you live, mate, it's always had that feel of a big arena show, even if it's been, you know, in a smaller, um, you know, in a, in a, in a club or, you know, bit of sort of, bit of sort of medium-sized venues. It's always had that feel about of, of an arena show. And I always felt that you guys took to the stage like it was, for want of a better term, the O2, because you mentioned that earlier. So it's got to be nice to have that kind of theatrical aspect in terms of the stage show along along with how you guys would oh, carry show anyway. Definitely. I mean, when you've got the room to move, I mean, we all move about a bit, you know. Um, you know, and plus I can bring the acoustic guitars out, which you can't do in a club because it just, you know, for want of a better word, they get damaged. You know, I can't have my 
expensive guitars being knocked about next to a pillar or PA or something because there's just no room to move stuff, you know, and things get damaged. So you can't do it there. But when you get a bigger stage and you've got room to breathe, you can then start bringing out the pieces that lift your show into that area anyway, you know, um, and it gives us more room. The songs can breathe. Uh, we all come from a fairly big stage background. So all of us have done huge gigs and theatre gigs for donkeys years. So we know how it works. And, you know, not being snobby about it, we, we find it very hard when we go to a gig and we're crammed in somewhere on a carpet. Yeah. And it's like, not saying, we're, not saying we're above it, not at all, but we just can't personally work that way. You know, we've always worked on a theatre stage, you know, or... or a bigger stage and we we find it very easy you know we can walk onto the o2 tomorrow not being funny it wouldn't phase us at all because we just love it you know the bigger the stage the more we can project and our songs do reach out into an auditorium you know that's that's the light and shade of cats in space you know we're not a rack of and stack and bang 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 no. see at the end band you know but everybody loses their minds you know we are you know we build light and shade into our songs you know and you need to have a, a room that breathes in order to do that. You, know, you can't do that. And you've got the, the chinking of the glasses at the bar over there and people shouting at the bar to get a drink in. You know, it's like we've done that. And it's like we're trying to do a ballad in chaps. You know what I mean? And, and it just doesn't work, you know. So, yeah, the whole the whole um, Kickstart the Sun theatre tour is just perfect and it's working really well. That's great. It's going well, mate. Have you had any sort of, personal highlights and over the last sort of three shows that you've the first three shows that you did always have had moments in them to be fair i mean there was i mean bootleg bandoleros doing that live was a massive task i mean it's okay I said to the guys it's not actually the most difficult song we play funnily enough but as a piece it is as a whole eight minute song it's blooming difficult and i was having kids about doing that literally so when when we pulled that off on the first night and everybody stomped in the right place and clapped, standing ovation, then the curtain comes down and says, see in 20 minutes, they're just like, what the hell was that? So all the people that hadn't seen this before have gone back to the bar with the lasting memory of what was that thing they just did, you know? So that was a real highlight to know that that song absolutely smashed people in, you know? Um, and just see the visuals, you know, some of the visuals James has done for like Thunder in the Night, with these giant speaker cones throbbing and glitter lips and crazy stuff. It's just really cool. And it's it's a real pleasure to be in this weird 1980s Doctor Who sci-fi environment playing these songs that we always wanted to play. So the whole thing's on, really. Yeah, and, and the crowd response, you know, the they're just making a lot more noise because I think they're so excited. You know, because we've hyped this up for six months and we could have fallen flat on our faces. They went, it wasn't that good. But it isn't. It's better. They're saying it's better what they thought it would be. You know, so it's all a highlight, really. Well, you've you've got some hell of a set of dates, mate. I've just been having a a quick look here left to do. You've got a good run of dates left. Just added um, Bathgate as well, I noticed. Yeah, we got Bathgate in. We got a London date in December as well. We're doing the um, assembly in Islington, which is a big gig. Oh, that's a great route. That's um, a great thing. I know. That's a <laughs> yeah. We need to do some promo for that one. But again, as our agent and our promoter said, for, you know, we got a promoter for that show, and they said you got to stick a flag in the sand. Mm. If you can stick a flag in the sand and say no, well, we're no, this is where we play now. Yeah. And if you can tell people that's where you're at, that's where you're at. You know, and if you keep being, you can't be a shrinking violet in this business. You know, you can't go, oh, we'll just go into the small room at so-and-so's because we know we can put 150 in there and sell it out. That's great. But where are you going to go from that? You know, you, you've you got to stick a flag in the sand and say, no, we, we are this. And uh, as we, we say in the band all the time, we, we're we forging our own furrow in the music business, really, because we don't really comply to a lot of other things. I mean, yeah, we, we still do the rock stuff. And we still, you know, want to do the festivals and, you know, support all these mega bands. You know, we still get stuff like that. But as a brand, we we have to be seen to to do what we believe. In. You know, and we and we believe that rock music in theatres is the future. And I've said it many times now, but 
it's proved it. Berry Apex will prove it. You know, more and more bands, will, the ones that can do it, will will go towards theatres because our age group wants to go to those kind of places to watch music, you know. And a lot of the tribute shows that are in those places are all rock-based now. You know, you've got, you know, all these hair metal shows that are in there and Dire Straits and ELO and Bon Jovi and ACDC. So it shows that rock music works in those places. So why doesn't it really work? So it's 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 a good call. Yeah, I mean, this is it. Like when um, I was looking at the you know stuff that's coming up at the Apex and everything, like you say, you've got you've got things like you've got Quo tribute shows and ACDC tribute shows. I mean, the Apex is now getting to the point where they are getting some great originals. As when we got Glenn Hughes, he's playing there in October. So cells are coming. Oh, is he? Wow. Yeah, he's in there um, in October. Um, yourselves in there. In um, a couple of weeks' time, Wishbone Asher playing there later on in the year. Obviously, I'm fortunate enough at my own festival to play there, so it is getting a good, starting a good thing. And I think it's right. I think I think you're right. I think for those sort of you know medium range bands where where bands need that, deserve that bigger um, aspect yeah. and venues like, like the Apex where it feels like a you know it's a like you say it's a great venue, it's a great setup. Perfect, um, yeah. You know, I mean, in the old days in London, you used to have places like the Lyceum, the Music Machine, um, you know, the Electric Forum, all these, all these kind of venues that were kind of seven to a thousand seats are standing. Hmm. And we used to go up there all the time. We watched Iron Maiden there, you know, the Lyceum. We watched Wild Horses numerous times, you know. And all those kind of rock bands back then were playing these those places. And they're only really old theatres, really. So... If you just knock that on to now, like you said, and you put Glenn Hughes or Cats in Space in the Apex, yeah. it's the same. Yeah. You know, it just it seemed to go out of vogue for years and years, and people went into all these funny rock venues. You know, we've done we've done a lot of those, and I just find them dull. You know, they're they're all black, stainless steel. They smell of last night's herbits in there. You know, six pound a pint. You stand up on a stainless steel platform watching a stainless steel stage with a, with a band on and a PA. They rack and stack them. You've got to be out by 10.30 because the nightclub comes in and, and the old whatever's coming in till three in the morning. And you walk out amongst millions of drunk people and it's like, I, I don't see the enjoyment in that, you know. And we've done them. You know, we've done those gigs, trying to get our gear out past the load of punters waiting to get in for the night shift, you know, and it's like, this isn't what rock music should be about. This is it should be an event, you know. A gig should be a memory, you know. When our fans come to see us at, you know, Redditch or you know Wimborne or London or wherever they come to, they make a day out of it. They come down, they they take in the town, you know. They they take over the town a lot of the times, you know. They go to the local Witherspoons and run a mock, you know. But they make an event out of it. And they make memories and people like that want to make memories, you know, and you don't make a memory going to one of those hell holes. It's just a black box, you know, I don't see it, you know. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create, a, you know, a, a, a memory for people, you know, come to one of our shows, make a day of it. We're the great ending to the evening and have a good day and have an ice cream in the afternoon or something. You know? it's, um, it's win win, you know. It is and like I say those the, the theatre shows and I've been to shows like that across the across the country and it places like that have an atmosphere about them naturally it's just something about mm -hmm. them they like say your bog standard bar kind of venue is stale gets stagnant you know there's nothing there's nothing yeah. to, don't get wrong I've had some good times and so certain 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 bands kind of lend themselves to those kind of environments and I've I've had some good times but like you say when you're getting pulled out and you know there's a nightclub going on straight afterwards you're like it just Put your end on a down immediately because like you've had a good time and all of a sudden it's like right you've got to go now and you're like well hang on a minute i've just you know yeah, second to go, down, i was watching yeah. the band yeah got there at two o'clock in the afternoon did the gig and then you just hoid out onto the street you know it's like nah not for us we, don't, we won't do that anymore just not interested you know unless you're going to get some level of respect no point so there's no memory there you know we won't make memories as well for ourselves because you know it's if you're a young kids it doesn't matter all the time in the world but you know when you get to kind of 40 plus you start thinking about well you know Ramstein as I've said this Ramstein sells 60,000 tickets at Coventry you know, they make you know it's an event it's like a real day out it's a whole big thing you know people will pay three four hundred quid for the day out there because it's such a huge thing to go to I said well we can do that on a small scale 
we can do that for 60 quid you know why not you know so but give them the venue and the show that make them want to do it you know so it's it just works you know i think it works in this day and age to, to do that kind of thing do you think this is what you'll do moving forward with subsequent tours when the, you know you move to next hour oh, yeah yeah that's how you want to yeah we won't go, won't go back from this no i mean we'll obviously after this tour finishes we'll regroup and look at what we're doing for next year you know there's the, the thing that you know we're not stupid you know, we're still a rock band at the end of the day we're not you know we're not trying to be lay mids you know we're a rock band you know but we you know we still want to go out with big bands and do big support tours in arenas and harrison and of course you would because that's that's where you build your your fan base so yeah we still love all that but they're big gigs you know what i mean so they're we even there we have the room you know we toured with thunder we had stage room to put to put on our little show you know you know when we did the o2 we had loads of room you know it was, it was fantastic so yeah you still do that but for our own headline shows we will have to we've set the bar now so we have to look yeah. at it from that way and again in theater land the way theaters work you know i mean we're talking two three hundred theaters in this country we could play mm. around the whole uk so there's loads to tilt at, and you, they, they also talk to each other. So if you've had a good show and they go, cool, that was good, they want you in their theatre. So you can keep doing this leapfrog thing where you can keep playing different theatres every year, and you can build up a really good show that way. You know, I mean, you wouldn't do it – you can't smash it in and out, year in, year out, because you will eventually get – you know, you'll tie people out. Yeah. But we can certainly build a very, very good theatre um, – way of doing our band you know and, that, and that's that's what we're aiming for you know on top of doing the, you know the, the the support gigs and stuff like that as well so it, it's win-win you know and hopefully we get to bigger theaters and start building up into you know the tcc level if you like you know where they're playing like 1500 2000 seats you know if you can get into that level you're having a bloody good career i'll tell you yeah, yeah. goes back to what Seriously. you said about you know like you know, this day and know yeah yeah, it was like what you were saying earlier about, you know, putting that flag in the ground and saying, right, that's what we play now. And then moving that flag to the next step and going, right, now we're mm. at this level. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're kind of, when you're in that kind of environment, you will attract a lot of curious theatre goers that don't know who you are, but they'll assume you're good because you're playing there and yeah. they'll come and give you a try. And they're a lot easier to get hold of those people than it is to get hold of new Facebook fans. <laughs> so we're finding the, what as we call it, the analog way going out to the street and going out to the people and saying, you will really like this band. They go, oh, yeah, I'll give that a try. You know, have you seen it on Facebook? No, no, I'm really doing that. Yeah. Or going on YouTube. A lot of our fans, they found us, they didn't even go on YouTube. They didn't even, you know, so it's like, you have to remember there's loads of people out there that just don't do computers or social media. They still do Classic Rock magazine or they still do Fireworks or Power Play, you know, or they're on a fan base on a little email address they've got on their computer, you know, so taking it to the people and in the theatres, you'll pick up a load of theatre goers that will just give your show a try. If they don't like it, they won't come back again. Yeah. But so far, judging by the merch we've been selling at the gigs we've done, and we've done really well on merch to new people that haven't seen us. Because also, this is the second Kickstart tour, so a lot of our regular fans have got a lot of the merch from the first tour. Yeah. So buy the new T-shirt, there's not much for them to buy, and yet we're still selling more than we did on the last tour. So it tells me we're selling a lot of product to new people yeah. that haven't got our music. Win. Yeah, win, if you win. Bring, yeah, if you're bringing in new people across this tour, mate, like you say, it's a win-win scenario. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's good. So um, you were talking about stage shows and all that, and I know you know doesn't come much better than Queen, and I know you went to the Freddie Mercury uh, Sotheby's thing, man. How was that? Oh, awesome! They're really. Yeah. That's really awesome. It was it was quite emotional actually because to see the stuff that he wore when I was a kid, yeah, you know, the Killing Queen for the coat, and, you know, the the half, um, you know, ballerina thing. Yeah. It's like wow, you know, that's and and the thing is, what what really was so brilliant. Bear in mind what Freddie Mercury, who he was, and mm. I know he had loads of people helping him out, and he probably didn't lift a finger in his life because that's the way he was. <laughs> but his stuff in there was immaculate. I mean, even like the white of the the running shoes. Yeah, there's a little bit of discolour on them from storage, but they were kept immaculate. So Mary Austin or whoever kept that stuff as it was really looked after it well because there was no mouldy, rubbishy little bits and bobs there. It was all very well looked after. Even his record collection was 
spectacular, you know, and his photos and all his Japanese art and his vases and furniture. It's like, wow, man, it's like, it was something to see. It really was. It's, yeah, very emotional day that was. Really, really was. But amazing. I bet. But I had a friend of mine go in there from the fact, no, I've not been down, but from the photos I saw from her, it looked like there was a, yeah, they look, look pretty, pretty insane. Yeah. Yeah. There was some, um, I mean, all the gold discs and stuff like that, you know, just amazing, all really nice condition. So, yeah. I'm, I'm going to sniff on a couple of bits, but I don't think I'll get them. <laughs> <laughs> I've got the bid card. Yeah. There's, I mean, the, some of the estimates are ludicrous. I, you know, I was laughing at them in there going, that's not going to go for that. It's going to go way more, you know. Yeah. Um, but there's a, there's a couple of bits I would really, really like to invest in. Um, but I've got a ceiling limit that I can go to. If it goes above, then I won't. But yeah. it's money in the banks. It's Freddie Mercury. You know, as I said to my, my girlfriend, I said, what people don't realise is I, I've been off with gold discs in the past and I've got a couple of gold discs here, but they're generated for just people in the record company that had them because the band sold so many. They're not personal. You need to have a band member's actual gold disc for it to be really valuable. So Freddie Mercury's Night of the Opera gold disc, I mean, come on. <laughs> if you want to get a gold disc, isn't that the one to get? You know, So it's not going to go for two grand. You know, It's going to go for a lot more than that. But the estimate's like two to three grand. It's like, you're joking me. No, that'd go for way more than that. Night no, of Freddy's gold disc. No, the Japanese businessman will be going nuts on that. Though, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, I but... live in hope of maybe sneaking something, but I don't think I will. <laughs> so uh, what does the rest of the year hang out for you guys after the, after the tour, and once the tour's uh, done and dusted, buddy? Um, we are, me and Stevie are currently demoing songs for the next album, so we're, we're beavering away hard at work. So we're never we're never sitting around doing nothing. We've been doing that for a couple of months, um, working out stuff, what we're going to do. We've got it all planned, as always, so we, we know exactly what we're doing, um, what it's going to be. We've got the title, we've got it all sorted. Nice. Obviously, we won't say nothing yet. But we've So we've got all that to tilt towards, and obviously – Recording the shows is the, the most important thing right now to make sure we get those sounding good so we can hopefully bring out a live album because everybody's saying to us, when are you going to bring a live album out? So, you know, like a proper full live album, not like Cats Alive, which is just like a little, like a mini album, really. Um, so, yeah, we're hopefully going to do that. So that will take up a lot of our time. And we'll be planning the usual nonsense next year and hoping for some... Yeah, little nuggets to fall into our lap along the way. But yeah, it's always go, go, go. Always go, go, go. So you never, never want to rest on your laurels, mate. And it sounds like it's uh, another. Yeah. Well, we got kickstart the sun to, to to beat. So we we've we've had a discussion about how we're going to do it, and we can, and we're under no pretenses that kickstart the sun was the end of an era, if you like. So we're not going to be just like trying to remake Kickstart the Sun, but we'll still do you know what Cats in Space does. But we are trying to, um, yeah, we, we're going to kind of have a slightly different approach on the next album. Um, not, nothing major, but just bands naturally go past the cycle. I find, and you you start when you've got your sound. There's only so many times that you can use it before you've got to stretch out a bit. So. We just don't want to keep rewriting the same thing, but it'll still be like Cats in Space. I'm sure everybody will say it'll sound exactly the same, but as far as we're concerned, we're we're, we're just, yeah, we're just going to let it rock, let's say. Oh, that's good, man. Oh, that's one. Well, Greg, always good to catch up with you, buddy, and I'll see you in a couple of weeks at the Apex. You too, Lee. See you at the Apex, get your tickets, folks, and uh, we'll see you all there. Be a good night. Yeah, definitely will, definitely will. If you guys are listening, haven't you got your tickets, trust me. You know, I, I mean, I haven't seen the show, but I always love seeing Cats in Space live, so really looking forward to it, man, with the visuals and everything's going to be great. Um, at the beginning of the interview, you know how this works now, mate, you've been on a few times. Uh, I'm going to play King of Stars, um, as it's just one of my favourites, uh, but what song of yours would you like us to play at the end of the interview? Any song, or has it got to be Kickstart the song? <laughs> no, any um, Oh, but, uh, what can I... I'll tell a song that I like, and it's going down really well on the tour, and it seems to have struck a chord with a lot of people. And that is a big balloon. Oh yeah, beautiful, beautiful song, which Damien wrote. Just the most amazing lyric for it's just, 
and it's really struck a chord with a lot of people. And um, it's my girlfriend's favourite Cats in Space song as well. So. Okay, mate. Well, we'll go with that. We'll play big, play big balloon and have a sigh in the garden. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Greg, man. Thanks for your time as always, buddy. Good to catch you. And, okay, uh, mate. See you in the apex. See you, yeah. Take care, buddy. Take care, mate.